If you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to turn with me to Acts chapter 7. We're going to pick up right where Pastor Don left us off. We're going to start in verse 54 of chapter 7 and then go through chapter 8, verse 3. And to slightly review what we have covered so far, where we were last week, um, Stephen, one of the first deacons of the early church, was faithfully preaching about Jesus to the people in Jerusalem and filled with a jealous rage, the Jewish leaders arrested him and put him on trial. And in that crucial moment, the Holy Spirit gave Stephen the boldness to preach an incredible message about who Jesus is. He, he laid out, as, as Don pointed out last week, he laid out how Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. That he's the greater Moses. That he is the Savior, the Messiah that they've been waiting for. And that they were wrong to reject Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And as Don hinted last week, what we'll look at today is how they responded. And spoiler... They didn't take it very well. Stephen is going to become the first martyr of the early church. The first person since Christ to die proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. And his death is actually going to spark a level of persecution that will swipe across that region in unprecedented fashion for that time in history. Now for us, we'd say, well, okay, man, that's terrible. And it's difficult for us to, to maybe try and relate to that because at least if we've spent our entire lives in this country, we don't know what that intensity of persecution is like. Nobody here, last I checked, has been killed for their faith. But what Stephen shows us that we can relate to is the human experience of facing difficulty and death, which every single one of us is either to some degree experiencing that now or maybe a loved one of ours is. Or we need to take this to heart, keep this in the back of our minds, because every single one of us inevitably will have to face difficulty and in the end, death. And those moments where we are in the, the most difficult, challenging, terrifying times of our life, or when we are, when death is knocking at the door, often those are the most crucial times. And when it comes to the legacy that we leave, with the people around us and the way that we impact their lives, not just now, but forever. And so the question that we are led to in those times or we need to wrestle with is how do we face death and difficulty well, with courage, with peace, with joy? And in the case of where we might be suffering at the hands of other people or in persecution, which may yet come in this way for us, how do we do that even with a heart of compassion? Well, what we will see in our passage today is how God provided Stephen what is needed to face death and difficulty well. In a way that I hope for some of us will equip us for the moments you are in right now. For some of us, we will know better how to support and love and pray for loved ones who are going through those things. And for the rest of us, that we would understand what we need to be equipped for those moments when they come. But with all that being said, follow along with me as I read Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 54, and then through chapter 8, verse 3. Again, speaking of Stephen, and he's still before the council of Jewish leaders at this point. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. 
And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. This is the word of the Lord. Needless to say, the Jewish council didn't like Stephen's message. And their rage and hatred led them to kill this man and sparked in Saul as the sort of tip of the spear to pursue Christians going house to house saying, do you believe in Christ? Do you believe in Christ? Investigating, interrogating. And when they found someone who believed in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, they arrested him. Men, women, didn't matter. You're going to prison or suffering a worse fate. And yet, in this moment, for Stephen, while surrounded by people who hated his guts, and even in the moments when they were each taking turns, picking up rocks and pelting him with it, he displays this supernatural grace this joy, this peace, even compassion for those who are killing him. How? How is it possible to face difficulty and death like that? Now, I know it's easy for us maybe to to look at somebody like Stephen in the Bible and say, well, that's Stephen. He's just a special guy. And make no mistake, he is a faithful representative of what it means to follow Christ here. But in Stephen and any person you see in the scriptures, it is not about Stephen being an amazing person. It is about the God he serves and the God, the Holy Spirit, who empowered him to be that kind of man in that moment. If you are a Christian today, the same power that enabled Stephen to be like that at that crucial moment lives in you, in the Holy Spirit. So we shouldn't distance Stephen, put him on some kind of unattainable pedestal, but say that same grace, that courage, that joy, that peace, even in the midst of terrifying, painful death, is something we can attain to by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm getting ahead of myself here, but really in this passage, what I want to show you is how God provides for Stephen and provides through this whole experience four things that can equip us to face death and difficulty well. And the first one, as I've already said, is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And when we understand that the Holy Spirit empowers Christians to be like this, like we see in Stephen, it makes sense. You know, consider the things that the Holy Spirit produces in a Christian's life, like fruit, it says in Galatians 5, through 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I could show you how all of those things were expressed through Stephen in this moment, but let me just focus on the first three. You know, first, let me start with joy. We see the Holy Spirit empowering Stephen with joy, a sense of satisfaction, contentment, even while the Jewish council is expressing their hatred towards him in a variety of ways. And yet he can't help but cry out in joy, celebrating, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen was celebrating what the Lord had revealed to him, that even in that moment, what you'd think that he had every right and excuse to complain and whine and say, woe is me and these people are terrible. He says, no, I see God. I have everything that I need in this moment. He had a supernatural joy because of the Holy Spirit's work in him. But we also see Stephen exemplify Holy Spirit-empowered peace. Not once do you see him express any kind of worry. He doesn't complain or become overwhelmed with self-pity or despair. He endured the most troubling circumstances with tranquility of heart and mind. And lastly, we see Stephen display a supernatural love 
or compassion for his persecutors. That the last recorded words we see from him are, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Those who are literally, at that moment, pelting him with rocks until he died. How could he do that? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a Christian in the truest sense of the word, given the gift of the Holy Spirit that all who trust in Jesus Christ receive the moment that they trust in him. And as we look to Christ and learn to rely on the Holy Spirit to shape us and lead us, it produces this kind of supernatural joy, love, and peace in us, even when we face difficulty and death. So the point of this is not be like Stephen. The point of this is know where Stephen got that love, that joy, that peace from. It was from the Holy Spirit. And in Christ, it is just as available to you as it was to him. Now the second thing that Stephen was equipped with and we need to be equipped with to faith, difficulty, and death well is, number two, the glory of God. It says Stephen was given this vision from God and he saw the glory of God. Of God. Now, glory is a term that is very commonly used, especially in, in sort of church environments, and is commonly misunderstood. Because it's, it's a difficult concept to really simplify and wrap our finite minds around fully. Because really, God's glory is all that is great and beautiful and good about Him. It's something that transcends our ability to really grasp it. But for the sake and perhaps risking oversimplifying it, That's what it is. The glory of God is the greatness and beauty of who God is. Now, how can the greatness and beauty of God help us when facing difficulty and death? To to begin to make a point, let me me just take a sidetrack. Have you ever seen the musical The Sound of Music? Okay. So in that movie or the musical, right, there's one of the songs called My Favorite Thing. When the dog bites, when the bee stings, when I'm feeling sad, I simply remember my favorite things. And then I don't feel so bad, right? So the whole thought, and we in our culture have said that, well, that's positive thinking. But this is actually pointing to a biblical concept that far outlives our American version of positive thinking. But this idea that in the midst of pain and fear, when we set our minds on something good and beautiful, it helps. It gives us courage and relief in those difficult times. You know, consider Philippians 4, 8 through 9. The Apostle Paul was writing to encourage and instruct the church of Philippi how to respond when the persecution they faced and the hardship that they were going through tempted them to grow anxious and fearful and dismayed. He writes, finally, brothers... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. But what is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent and worthy of praise? God So when we think about the ways that God is all of those adjectives and more, it leads us to experience his peaceful presence with us. And all those things are are little facets of God's glory. Or another way that this has been expressed more in a Christian way is through the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Look at Jesus and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Now the third thing we need and and Stephen had to face difficulty and death well is the hope of Christ. The hope or, or confident expectation that we can have in Christ. And here it's presented by a combination of two truths, I believe. First of all, that Jesus reigns. 
Notice the, the vision that God gives Stephen in this moment. While he's in the most dangerous and terrifying situation that will eventually lead to his death, the Lord showed him Jesus at the right hand of God. Now that's a phrase in the Greek word, which is dexios. And it, really the right hand of God means a place of authority, a place of honor. It's often a, a phrase that's referring to the throne of heaven. And so in that moment, Stephen was assured who is in power. He saw who is in control. It wasn't the council of Jewish leaders in front of him. It wasn't Caesar. It wasn't any of his enemies. It was Jesus who sat on heaven's throne. So he could take comfort in knowing that even in the midst of this painful, scary situation, Jesus was still king. He was still in control. Now I know particularly for those of you who maybe are here and, and maybe you're new to the faith or, or maybe you're not a believer, you say, how is it a comfort to know that Jesus is control, in control when you're going through a hard time? Like, doesn't that, shouldn't that just make you angry that Jesus is letting this happen? And a lot of people go there. Well, here's the thing. I, I, I can't actually speak for everyone. But it seems like throughout Christian history, the truth that Jesus is on the throne, he reigns and he is in control, has been a consistent source of comfort and strength and encouragement for those who have faced daily peril. One of my favorite examples of this is a, a missionary named John G. Patton. He was a missionary in the 19th century to what we now call the islands of Vanuatu. Okay? And so he's a guy who literally went to an island very quickly after his wife died of disease, lost his kids, and finds himself in, surrounded by savages that threaten to kill him. And then the, the Western traders that come don't like him either because as he's teaching the savages of that land about Jesus, they might not want to buy their guns and stuff anymore. So literally, John had no one on his side. And yet in his journals, which he, they compiled together and made his autobiography, he, he wrote this. Our safety lay in our appeal to that blessed Lord who had placed us there and to whom all power had been given in heaven and on earth. He that was with us was more than all that could be against us. This is strength. This is peace. To feel in entering on every day that all its duties and trials have been committed to the Lord Jesus. That come what may, he will use us for his own glory and our real good. Because Jesus reigns, it means everything serves a purpose. Everything works together for the good of his people. And we're going to dive into that more deeply later on. But this shows us how Christ's place of authority on heaven's throne serves as a source of comfort and encouragement even in the most desperate of times. But the other part of the, the hope that we can have in Christ that I believe is presented to us in this passage is that death is not the end. Do you notice how in verse 60 it describes Stephen dying? It says he fell asleep. And that's not because Stephen literally took a nap. It's not that he passed out. Stephen is dead. Make no mistake. But God, Holy Spirit, specifically inspired Luke to describe Stephen's death as Stephen falling asleep. Why? Because for the person who trusts in Christ, dying is like falling asleep and waking up in the glorious presence of God like a dream. But not a dream you wake up from later. A dream that is eternal, real, and free of suffering and pain. Knowing that death is not the end has always been a comfort for God's people. And particularly to know that what awaits us on the other side of death that is more like a doorway than a stop 
far outweighs even the most wonderful things. And understandably so. Like, as, as we approach that, and, and I know I've come alongside people as they've gone through that process of, of processing their own days coming to an end or, or their loved ones, it is sad and it should, it should be. Let's not get that mixed up. But the sting of death is a fear to lose. This fear that, oh no, if I lose these people, my family, my kids, if I'm not going to be with them anymore. Again, that's understandable. But what is gained in Christ on the other side of death far outweighs everything that we may lose here. There's more I, I was going through my mind to say there, but I think I want to stop there. Now the fourth thing, kind of piggybacking on the previous point, is that from this passage, we can know that God works through all things to fulfill His purposes. How do I see this here? So as we learned earlier, right, Jesus reigns, and this is what He does with the power and authority He possesses. So, Don pointed this out rightfully last week. But we, we should, at this point, sort of take a flashback, okay? If this was, you know, some sort of dramatized TV show, I'd, I'd hope to get the little sort of foggy mist around the screen. We'd go back to the scene of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, gathered with his followers, and he tells them that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they will be his witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The disciples already know how this is going to go. But up until that point, the church and the message of Jesus Christ was contained in Jerusalem. Maybe some, out, some villages just outside, but, but Judea hadn't been reached. Samaria hadn't been reached. The ends of the earth were way unreached. And yet what we see here is that through the death of Stephen and the persecution of the church, even though it is the Christians running for their lives to all these different regions, fleeing their homes except for the apostles who stayed, God is still at work through that. He's actually fulfilling his purposes. And the message of Christ was spread then to Judea, and Samaria, and as we will see throughout Acts, it spreads and spreads to the ends of the earth and is still spreading, primarily because the hardship and pain and persecution that Christ's people face throughout the world is driving them to the places where Christ is not yet known. It always serves a purpose. You know, there's, there's talks and, and at times we might you know, I, I know there's a lot of podcasts or movies and, you know, while I was on vacation, I, I read this book called Unbroken, which is the, the biography of a man named Louis Zamperini. And you read his story and everything that he went through and, and eventually, you know, came to faith in Jesus Christ. And you think, man, like this amazing story and it all worked out. And what is it all pointing to? It's all leading for Louis's life to matter because his life led people to Jesus. Even while he had a troubled childhood, even while he was, he was a bombardier in World War II and his plane crashed and he was stranded at sea for the longest time that had ever been recorded, was a prisoner of war, tortured, broken. And then Christ saved him. And now his story is reaching millions and showing that Jesus is the one that can heal the, whole, the soul that is broken by war, by tragedy. We want our lives to count, right? You know, we talk about wanting to live for something bigger than ourselves. At least sometimes we do. There's no greater example of that than with Christ. And if we have trusted in Jesus Christ, then know that every part of your story, every ounce of suffering, all the way up to your final breath, Every part of it isn't wasted. 
Nothing is pointless. No tragedy that you've had to endure. No pain you've had to push through. Physically, emotionally, no loss. Everything is a calculated part of God working uniquely through your life, if you've trusted in him, to make him known where he is not yet known. I've seen this countless times. The number of people whose perhaps their children have wandered off, turned away from Jesus, and they pray and spend decades praying for their kids to come back, praying for their kids to come back, and while they are alive, they don't see it. But then the child attends the funeral. The gospel is preached at the funeral, and finally something clicks. Or the amount of people who, because of the tragedies that they've had to endure, and then they've come to Jesus Christ. Maybe those, those painful situations drove them to seek help from Jesus and they found that sauce. They found that peace, that joy, that hope, that healing that they needed in him. And now they have the chance to tell them their story. All of its bumps and bruises along the way to somebody else who's going through something similar so that they might come to trust and follow Christ. It's never wasted. If you are trusting and following Jesus Christ, all of your pain, even on your deathbed, it's serving a purpose so that other people might know Jesus. And we should and, and can derive a sense of courage and comfort and strength from that. Because isn't that the temptation of pain and despair? To say, man, this hurts so much. Or, man, I'm so scared of dying and thinking, is this going to count for everything? Did I waste my life? But if you're trusted in Jesus Christ, the answer to that question will always be no. Because Jesus, in ways beyond what you can even comprehend and probably beyond what you will know in this lifetime, is working in you and through you to make himself known and to fulfill his purposes. I was talking with somebody, uh, I think it was last week. Again, memories are kind of faded. I'm, I think I'll get some clarity hopefully this week. But was talking about how, you know, we, we talk about, and we don't fully know the picture, but when we get to heaven, meeting the people that God used us to reach. And, you know, there, there might be those people that we know of. You know, maybe one of our kids we got to lead to Christ, or, or maybe somebody in, you were a children's ministry volunteer, a youth director, and you saw someone come to faith in Jesus, and you were there, and you're like, oh man, I can't wait to see them again. But what I'm, I'm looking forward to is, is just the stories that are beyond my ability to grasp. You know, maybe somebody walks up and, on the streets of gold and says, hey, you don't know me, but you preach the gospel to so-and-so. And then they shared the gospel with my friend and they shared it with me. But Jesus used you and it eventually got to me. Those kinds of the strange and, and wonderful webs of connections, that is how God is working in this world to save people one soul at a time. We don't always see the fruit. And you think about poor Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. If you never read Jeremiah, I just encourage you... If, if you struggle with depression like me, just pick your days to read it, okay? But you think about this man. Now, he's called the weeping prophet for a reason. He spent his entire life faithfully preaching the truth of Jesus Christ to the people of God, and he didn't see a lick of progress. And yet he's part, his life is part of this redemptive plan that led to Christ, and millions have come to faith through the truth and life of Jeremiah that seemed like a waste. So all that to say, particularly if you're in a situation right now where you're, you're hurting, maybe you or a loved one right now are facing death in the eyes, know that if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, it's not a waste your pain is serving a purpose. I can't exactly say what it is, how it's all going to work out. I don't know. But what I do know is in general, it's going to work out for God's glory. Other people are going to know about him through you. 
And it is going to lead to your greatest good, one way or another. Now, it's interesting, right? You know, another way we see this in our story is it talks about Saul several times in this passage, right? Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Acts, Saul will later become a Christian and become Paul. And Paul, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Even Paul is now this echo from Stephen, knowing that you can die for Christ and have an impact on the lives of those that are killing you. Because that was Saul. Now, now, Saul didn't become a Christian immediately after Stephen's execution, but you better believe that that planted a seed. You better believe that that was a first step towards Paul eventually becoming a Christian. So God is able to work his purposes through all things. Now, I, I know, it, and I've had conversations with people, and particularly um, those that don't trust in Jesus Christ yet, this is a really sticky subject that's oftentimes pushed back against. There's no way. I mean, you look at the tragedies, you look at the headlines, what's going on in our world, there's no way this could possibly work for good. It's too bad. And that's why I think we always need to look to the ultimate example of this. The ultimate example of God's work through tragedy, pain, and death to produce something good is the cross of Christ. Jesus Christ, a perfect, sinless man, suffered the greatest injustice of history. Murdered on a cross. And yet through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, God worked to provide a way of salvation to reconcile the nations of sinners to himself, to offer forgiveness for sins and eternal life. So you see, the greatest good in history was accomplished through the greatest suffering in history. And if God can do that, then whatever you're going through, God can work in it for good too. Now, I'd like to close with a prayer that was written by a pastor and theologian that I've, I've been consulting throughout my studies in Acts. His name's R. Kent Hughes. And in response to this part of, of God's word that we've been studying, he, he wrote this prayer, prayer and I, I think it's a, a fitting prayer for all of us, whether you're staring death right in the eyes right now, or maybe a loved one is beside you, or this is something you just need to be equipped for because that day is coming at some point down the road. Oh God, help us to live, to speak, and to die the way Christ would and did. Help us to look beyond the enemies, the obstacles, the problems and perils, to see the Savior who died for us and who now stands with open arms waiting to welcome us home. Help us to stand tall by divine grace. In Jesus' name, amen.